week five, the mystery of avatar or divine incarnation. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter states, as we saw last week, O Bharata, whenever virtue declines and vice predominates, I incarnate on earth. Taking visible form, I come to destroy evil and re-establish virtue. What is the mystery of this divine manifestation? Great avatars such as Krishna and Jesus Christ are born as babies, even as we all are. They take human form and go through normal human experiences as they grow from childhood to adulthood. They eat, they play, they may seem to suffer sickness and disappointment like the rest of us. In what way are they different from other human beings? The important thing to understand is that even as they are like us, so are we also like them. Their realization can be ours too. They come on earth to show us our own divine potential. The difference lies not in the manner of their manifestation on earth, but in the consciousness with which they are born. All things are condensations, so to speak, of the cosmic vibration OM, described by Saint John's Gospel as the Word. Most human beings, however, are unconscious of their divine origin. The avatars, on the other hand, come consciously as manifestations of that divine reality. As the Gospel says in the first chapter, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Programs in the last two weeks with Shivaniji and she's been coming to Pune for the last 15 years she does not need an introduction, but it's nice. It's very inspiring to see and hear your introduction. It gives us a lot of inspiration and life direction. Shivani ji came to Swami Krinandaji and Ananda in California over 50 years ago. And uh, Swami, she is the founding member of Ananda's work in not only in Ananda village, but many other centers and communities across the U.S. Then in the mid-1980s, when Swamiji started the work in Europe and particularly in Italy, he asked Shivaniji to actually move there. Shivaniji speaks fluent Italian and has been in Assisi now for close to 40 years. And from there, uh, in Italy, she established the Raj Yoga School of Ananda Yoga and of uh, the Institute of Life Therapy for Self-Healing and the Institute for uh, Yogananda Academy for sharing Paramahansa Yogananda Ji's techniques and across Europe she's done outreach for over 40 years and also in Russia and other parts and then of course as Swami uh, when he came to India in 2003 he invited his best teachers and people who would help him and thankfully Shivani Ji responded and we have had the good fortune I remember 2009 uh, sitting in Shivani Ji's meditation teacher training right here in Pashan taking notes of how to share master's teachings <laughs> and uh, we have many many so many of us have benefited from her very diligent sharing of master's teachings and Swamiji's life example 
Also in the last two weeks in Pune particularly, Shivani ji has been giving us such enlightening deep talks about Master's teachings on health and healing. She has compiled them in three books. They are to my right, to my left. Uh, many of us have been attending those workshops. And I urge you, today is on one level the last day to get your book signed by Shivani ji because then she will be uh, traveling to New Delhi, NCR region where she has classes and then to Chandigarh. Uh, where she will culminate the India tour of launching the book and introducing it to all Guru Bhais. So also Shivani ji is a Kriya Acharya. Swami ji asked her to initiate people in the sacred science of Kriya. So Shivani ji, we are so happy that you are here with us. And tomorrow evening, we are not wasting any time. We are having more detailed discussions with Shivani ji to see how in the Later part of this year or next year, she could come and stay for longer periods, perhaps a month or longer. And how could we better utilize her time, the beautiful books that she has brought, and maximize that outreach. So I welcome you on behalf of Ananda Sangha Pune to give us a talk today for our Sunday Satsang Shivani Ji. Good evening to all of you. I'm glad to see many of you whom I've seen before and others whom I have, uh, that I'm meeting for the first time. I'd like to share just a few final thoughts with you for uh, this time that I'm here in Pune. Each one of us comes with a mission. We come with past karma, that's why we're here. We have things that we need to complete. And each of us comes also with a dharma, which means a pathway to our growth. So when we arrive, each one of us, we are at a particular point in our evolution. From uh, ignorance, from unawareness to complete awareness. And when we are awake and ready, especially in this incarnation, because we are very much favored to have these avatars as our spiritual guide, we come to know what our dharma is. And we come to know what karma we have come to complete. Um, if you don't already know what those things are, I suggest you think about it. You meditate on it. Uh, you ask your higher self. You ask the masters, what is the karma that I've come to finish, to complete? And what is the mission that I have? This evening, we're talking not about our dharma, but the dharma of realized masters. Sometimes uh, people have come to me or others of the acharyas asking this question, uh, how can I choose my guru? And that is an interesting question. It's a strange question. It's, it's the wrong question. Okay? Because we don't choose the guru like we do someone to be our cook or someone to work in our business where we're looking for the highest qualifications. Sometimes people say, I want the highest possible guru for myself. So I'm going to choose Babaji because he's a Mahavatar. And these other ones, they're just avatars. <laughs> so I'm going to go for the top. And there are many people, and sometimes even you know, nationalities have this consciousness, you know, like, I've got to have the top. Well, we don't choose who our guru is. We are, in fact, chosen. One of our gurus, Jesus Christ, made this very clear to his disciples at the time when he spoke to them for the last time. 
this particular moment is called in the Bible the Last Supper. It's when he was meeting with his disciples, with the apostles, uh, at a ceremonial uh, dinner. And they didn't know it, but it was the last time that they would be with him when he had a physical body on this physical plane. And he gave them wonderful advice. He summed up his whole mission, his dharma, and he told them about how they should proceed after his passing. And if you're interested in what he said, because it's, it's beautiful and it's inspiring, I recommend that you look at the Gospel of St. John, who Master said was the most highly evolved of the apostles. The apostles were all saints. Otherwise, they would not have been called to help Jesus, to be with him and help him in his mission. But John especially was uh, very intuitive. And um, why am I talking about? Yes, I'm talking about John because he wrote about the Last Supper and what Christ said at that time. So it's the Gospel of St. John, uh, chapter 15. Look it up tonight or sometime next week. And one of the many things that Jesus said to them was, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you because you have been given to me by my Father. So in a way, it's not even that Jesus chose, that the avatar chooses. There's a, the mystery of it, you know, is how a master and his disciples come together is really some cosmic algorithm. And we have no idea how that works. But I'd like to give us perhaps some little insight into that. This evening we heard the reading from Bhagavad Gita, is chapter 4. And the reading, I'll read it again, the one verse. And then I'm going to read something that comes right before it. This is, uh, this is Krishna speaking to Arjuna. And he says, Whenever virtue, dharma, declines, and vice, a dharma, is in the ascendant, I incarnate myself on earth as an avatar, appearing from age to age in visible form. I come to destroy evil and to reestablish virtue. So the avatars have a dharma. They don't have any karma, but they have a dharma to fulfill. I'd like to read what comes just two verses before this. This is uh, still chapter 4, and this, this will be verse uh, Stotra 5. The blessed Lord said, Many have been my births, and many yours also. I remember all of mine, though you remember yours not. Okay? So I'm not going to focus on why we don't remember our previous births. That's not the point for this evening. The point is that Krishna, as an expression of Lord, of uh, Vishnu, says, many have been my births, and I remember all of them. Now, how many times has God incarnated on earth? So from the uh, Vaishnava scriptures, uh, we know there have been, what, nine incarnations of Vishnu? you know, from, you know, the, the dwarf and the fish and so forth, up until Krishna. And we're all waiting, are we not, for Kalki, avatar. It's just like the Jewish people are still waiting for the Messiah. But Krishna says, I have had many births. Hmm? Do you think nine qualifies as many? I think he was talking about many, many births. Now, here in India and also in the Christian world, 
the common belief is that the avatar is a direct descent, is a special creation of God. God just molded this perfect figure and endowed this figure with divine powers. But what Swami Kriyananda and Master explains to us is that these individuals, whether it be Krishna or Buddha or Jesus Christ or the avatars of uh, Kriya Yoga, they have had many births as human beings. They have progressed, they have evolved to the point where they have become completely free. They have become Jivan Mukta. They have become uh, Param Mukta. They have become Avatar. And some have become Jagat Guru, an avatar for the whole world. Now, in these past incarnations of the avatars, I think that we have been in relationship with them. And the reason I think this is that when we look at the disciples of Jesus, there's a curious fact. Many of them were his relatives. Some of the apostles were his cousins. Some of the 40 were related to him in one way or another. Uh, uh, Lazarus, uh, Mary, and Martha were all relatives of Jesus. And how about Krishna? Was he not related also by blood to the Pandavas, to Uddhava, to others? So for me, this is symbolic. Krishna stands in different relationships to his disciples, right? Uh, to Yashoda, he's her child, her foster child. You know? To the gopis, he's their playmate. You know? To Radha, the uh, uh, figurative Radha, he is the beloved. To the citizens of Dwaraka, he is their king. To uh, Many of the Pandavas in the Kauravas, he is their counselor. What does this tell us? That we have been in relationship to our guru in many past lifetimes. You know, and who knows how long ago it started. But we have had loving and growing relationships with them. And these gurus have galloped ahead to their realization, to their liberation, to become great avatars. And they have brought us along, their relatives, their friends. So that mysterious algorithm somewhere up in the causal world, perhaps it's not so mysterious because I think that we are brought together with great souls whom we have known in the past, with whom we have grown, with whom we have had loving relationships and possibly also difficult relationships. We already belong to them. Now, what about these great gurus, these jagat gurus, the great avatars? I'd like to say a few things to give us perhaps a deeper understanding of who our gurus are. We love them. They love us. We accept them. We try our best to do what they ask of us. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, if you are my disciples, you will do what I ask you to do. 
You know, this is part of being a disciple. Now, the gurus don't expect us to be perfect. In fact, Master said once, and this is in conversations with Yogananda, if you do even 1% of what I ask you, you will find God. Maybe not in this life, but you will progress on the spiritual path. I used to think it was 10%, and somebody showed me the citation that said 1%. So, Master, all avatars, they come with their disciples, and they have come with us. What is their mission? An avatar comes not just simply and importantly to help his disciples to grow and progress and to give darshan, okay? but an avatar comes to lift, to uplift humanity. They have the power not just to help their disciples and take on some of the karma of their disciples, but to uplift the entire world. And this is what our masters have done, starting with Babaji. The reason I'm mentioning this is because so often it can happen that we think of these great masters as ours and ours only. Somebody might come to you and say, I met somebody who uh, knows Babaji, who met him in the Himalayas. Might you say to that person, but he, is he our Babaji? You know, is he the Babaji of the autobiography? And the same thing with Yogananda Ji. These masters come with messages and they set into motion things that will help a vast amount of people, not just now, but into the future. What did Master do that is going to go into the future and not be limited to us, their disciples? Master came to bring Kriya Yoga as the technique for self-realization. Will the world receive Kriya Yoga just through Yogananda and his descendants? No. There's a vast line of Kriya Yoga, and there are others. Master put it into motion. Babaji put it into motion in the Western world. Master came to be a bridge between East and West, he said he wanted to bring the Western material efficiency together with the Eastern spiritual efficiency. And going into the future, he said that it would be America and India that would join and lead the world into a new age. Master came as a bridge between science and spirituality. Okay. What was his first talk in the United States? The science, the science of religion. Okay. What did his guru write? The holy, the holy science, which wasn't its real title in Bengali, Kaivalya Dharshana, okay. but the holy science. So from Master's time, what do we see in science? That science is coming closer and closer and closer to the spiritual truths, to the eternal truths of Sanan Dharma. Master came to set into motion the need for spiritual cooperative communities, saying they would be the form the model for the civilization of the future. 
So there are things that Master came to do that reach far beyond us, their disciples. And the same thing with Swami Kriyananda. Yes, he developed the spiritual communities, the satsangas, where we live, where we take our inspiration, where we are nourished, where we serve. But Swami Kriyananda also had a dharma to set into motion some, some things for the world. Education for life is going to go and spread and go into future generations and transform the uh, educational systems of many countries. Master started the idea, Swami moved it forward, and now it's in our hands. Swami started in 2009 the Naya Swami order, the New Age Renunciate order, that is not limited to Ananda. There are thousands of people following different paths, following no paths. There are Buddhists, there are Catholics, there are other Christians, there are even agnostics who belong to this order, who declare themselves to be pilgrims or brahmacharis or tyagis or nayaswamis. This, these are seeds that go far beyond the dharma of helping the disciples. So what is our role? What can we do? Every great master, every great avatar who has great dharma, great mission, they come with helpers. Jesus came with his apostles. Buddha came with his few uh, disciples. Master came with his. Swami came with his. Why are we here? For our own growth, certainly. And that is our priority. But we have been chosen by our masters, these avatars, to help them in their world mission. And that's part of our growth. That's part of our blessing, that we have the opportunity so close to Master's life, so close to Swami Kriyananda's life, to be the channels to be the hands, the feet, the inspiration, the energy, the worker bees in the hive of self-realization. So let's have deep appreciation and reverence for what our masters, and especially Yoganandaji, came to do as his dharma, his mission given to him by God. And let's do our part. Let's do our sadhana so that we have the spiritual strength and the intuition and the capacities to help these avatars uplift the world. They came, they went and they left to us the responsibility, the possibility to help them in their great mission. And it's not just in this incarnation. We've been doing it before, and if we have to incarnate wherever we incarnate, we'll probably be doing it again. So let's be deeply grateful to these masters, that they have chosen us, that they have chosen to come to this planet, and that they continue from where they are in that divine mission. It didn't stop when they left the physical planet. They actually are more capable now that they don't have a body 
of carrying forth their God-given mission. And they are inspiring each one of us every day of how we can help them. So all praise and all thanks to our great gurus. Thank you.